it's in the interest of time, I had some warm ups, but the lesson went on. So, can we go straight to the lesson? Even odd, which I know we talked about, but specifically focusing on calculus. Uh, by way of review, if a function is even, you can prove it's even by showing that when you put in a negative, what happens? Same as when you put in a positive at that same absolute value. Symmetry in an even function is about what? At the y-axis. Okay? To demonstrate a function is odd, you show that when you put in a negative, you get the opposite y result as if you would put in a positive. And the uh, symmetry is about the origin. It's point symmetry. Okay. Um, let's pause here. And this is a final question on the CU Cal 1 final uh, that I found. Um, company two years ago. So um, it's used to this idea. You can see the odd ideas in there. It's used in curve sketching once in a while. I remind you, not every function has to be even or odd. Sometimes it can be neither. So what we're going to try and do is collect their information and figure out what this graph looks like based on these hints or clues they give you. Uh, let's start with f has a horizontal asymptote at y equal 1. I didn't feel like they were very clear about that. But uh, whether it was on the positive side or the negative side, but I, based on what came later, it had to be on the positive side. Now, please don't assume that horizontal asymptotes have to be followed in the same way on both sides. In other words, in fact, because this is odd, I'm fairly certain that this will not be an asymptote on the left. Because this is odd, what will be an asymptote on the left? Negative. Y equals negative one will be an asymptote on the left if it's symmetry about the origin. Okay, so we're going to have two different horizontal asymptotes. And I know you haven't seen that much or at all, but that happens. Um, let's go with this point. F of 1 is 2, which is actually one point, but you could say they're really giving you two. The fact that they give you one two also tells you what point is on the curve. Negative one, negative one, negative one, negative two. So you can use that. When it's even rod, any point given is actually two points, you could say. It looks two, two. Okay. It doesn't look symmetric at all. All right. Um, let's go on the interval from zero to one. <clears throat> That's an interval, by the way, not a point. On the interval from zero to one. F prime is positive, F double is positive. Give me that two behaviors implied by that statement. Uh, how much? F prime positive, F double positive. Increasing in? Concave up, beautiful. Would you draw a zero to one increase in concave up? On one to infinity, what's going on there, Ellie? What is implied by f prime negative, f double positive? Concave up and decreasing. Now that actually jives with having to approach the asymptote. The only way it's going to approach that asymptote is if it's decreasing. Which that, so that makes sense. In concavity, that also makes sense. Are we cool? Well, what about the... Uh, actually, let's go on to this, and then we'll get to the symmetry part of it. If f prime is 0 at x equals 0... Then what happened? Flat horizontal tangent at the origin. What about derivative doesn't exist at 1? I kind of already have 1 going on. Does that confirm, my picture confirm that? Yeah, yeah there's a sharp turn there. So now what about the negative side? If, it's symmetric. Yeah, it's symmetric. So will it be concave? It was concave up over here, so here it's concave down. And now concave down, and so like that, yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about the, a little bit of those relationships that you'll see make a lot of sense. Say you sketch an even function. Uh, parabola, I don't, doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Cosine. And would you draw a tangent line at a positive x, and then it, the reflection of that point at the same 
distance from the axis on the negative side, would you draw a tangent or tangent? What does it look like the relationship between the slopes and the Give me one relationship. Opposite, opposite sign. What about reciprocal? We almost always say that right after. Opposite reciprocal or just straight up opposite? Just straight up opposite. Opposite sign, not reciprocal. Um, that seems to indicate that the derivative at a negative x is the opposite of the derivative at the positive x. Well, shoot, that seems to indicate that the derivative of an even function is odd. That's odd. Well, let's uh, investigate that for a few cases. f of x, is that even, odd, or neither? Remember, not everything has to be even or odd. Even, odd, or neither? It's odd. Uh, there's symmetry about the origin. What is the derivative of tangent? Secant squared. Uh, if you know secant's graph, it looks like this. I imagine the square then would cause everything to be positive, and the shapes would probably change a little. The asymptotes would be unchanged, but they would probably grow faster and flatten out faster. But any which way you look at it, either that or 1 over cosine squared. What's 1 over cosine squared? Either or not. It's easy. So it seems like we have an odd function. We have an even derivative. What about x squared plus 3? Even odd or neither? Even. F prime is 2x. So that derivative is odd. Now, in the previous notes I had, you prove, you can prove that the derivative of an even is not by definition of the derivative. You can use the definition and put it to negatives and so this can be proven, but it didn't stick very well for the BC students, so I think this is going out a little better. Would you try those other three? In each case, you're saying, is the original even or odd, or neither? What is the derivative? And is the derivative even or odd? So, sign, even, odd, or neither. Odd, derivative, cosine, oops, x equals cosine. And cosine, even, odd, or neither. It is even. Uh, 2 cosine is even. The derivative is negative 2 sine, which is odd. So it seems like the derivative of the even is continuously coming out on vice versa. What about x cubed plus 1? Even out or neither? Neither. neither? I then assume that the derivative would also be neither, yet the derivative is 3x squared, which is even. Now that's a bit of a crapshoot there. In terms of the general rules, which again can be proved, derivative of an even function must be the derivative of a not function must be even. However, the derivative of a neither could actually be a million different things. Okay, it could be anything. Could be even, could be odd, could continue to be neither. Um, it's important that you, you understand these are rules for derivatives, not antiderivatives. If you think that uh, integrating x squared, for example, which is even, will be odd, 
that's not necessarily oops, not necessarily true because if there's oops, depending on the constant that you get, that could totally ruin the odd symmetry that you would expect. So there's so much gray area with that plus C when you anti-differentiate that you really can't apply these rules backwards. Are you with me? Okay, uh, this one I saw in a college text, and this was a humdinger here, so let's swap through this here. Um, you have this normal line, equation of a normal line. They give you some background. Uh, F is even. At x equal 3, they tell you this is the normal line for at x equal 3, and they want you to talk about what's happening at negative 3. Now, obviously, we're going to use the even idea to make those judgments, but, um, man, I had the hardest time keeping all this straight in my head. A picture helped me quite a bit. The tangent, the normal line, which is perpendicular, is negative 2 thirds x plus 7 thirds, yeah? And that's normal at x equal 3. A picture will help you, at least as you go, confirm what your analytics will say. Is, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so the curve, whatever it's doing over at 3, I don't even know if it's above or below the axis, but the normal line has a negative slope. Okay, down 2 over 3. Here's the normal line. which means the tangent line would be here, up 3 over 2. Bless you. It's up 3 over 2. Do you all agree so far, even though we haven't even touched the even or not component? You with me? Yes. OK. Um, so. Let's talk one or both of these here. Let's let's go with the slope first. F prime at negative three. If this is an even function, then what should the slope be like at negative three instead of the positive three I slope I know to be three halves? It'll be negative three halves. Okay. Remember, if f is even. <coughs> And f prime is odd. So I should get the opposite sign slope for my derivative. Right? So it would be something like negative. Are you with me? Yes. OK. Um, what about f at negative 3? f at negative 3. <coughs> because it's even, what should f at negative 3? F at F is even. So F at negative 3 should equal F at 3. Okay. How do I find F at 3? Put it into the... But isn't... This is an F. How can I... Is, is that still going to be... Can I plug 3 into that equation? You can one. Okay, there you go. It's, it's tangent to the curve. Remember that points of tangency, they're shared by the normal line, the tangent line, and the curve. So that point is not only on the curve, F, but it's also on the tangent line and the normal line. So F at 3 is on the normal line. So I can plug that in. I can say something like Y equals negative 2 thirds of 3 plus 7 thirds is negative 2 plus 7 thirds, or I want to plug in negative 3. I want to plug in, yeah, it's tangent at positive 3. So I know this point to be. Um, so 1 third, yeah? Now I know then, from that I conclude that f of 3 is 1 third. And because f is even, that should be the same as f at You with me? I got it. the good news is these the ones on the book are not nearly this hard. Uh, in the college textbook, maybe this one. Okay. Uh, rules for integrals. So this will be review. So let's go quickly. Um, tell me, uh, Brian, what's the integral from A to A? 
Zero. Yes, good point. Uh, Robert, when you switch some of its integration from A to B to B to A, what happens? It's negated. True that. Okay. Um, let's go this side. Mr. Boyd, what happens when you have a constant in the integral? What can you do with that constant? Move it out front. Uh, let's see. Mitch, do you have the integral of a sum? What can you do? Split them up. You can indeed split them up. Can you do that with a product? Cole. You may not. That's absolutely a terrible travesty of math. Um, additivity. If you go from A to B in one region and then from B to C in the other, that's equivalent to the single region of what? A to C. Okay. Now this is the part that I want to focus on. That's the part that's new. Two even ideas. Say you had a region. Would you draw me an even graph? And on the left-hand side, let's go from A to B. And by symmetry on the right-hand side, negative B would the, be the far left point and negative A on the far right. Very cool. It's not very good symmetry, but you get the idea. Um, two ideas. If F is even, then what do you know about the integral from negative B to B? Kind of a time saver. It's two times the area from zero to B. Now it's still one integral, but zero is so much easier to work. So that's why it would be done, right? Um, what about the integral? This is the one that gets people. If you were talking the positive region from A to B, what's the equivalence on the left hand side? Yeah, it has to be from negative B to negative A to be equivalent, not negative A to negative B, which would pull it backwards and they would be not the same area, okay? Um, draw yourself an odd region. And again, A to B and negative B and negative A. Um, if F is odd, that's the greatest possible because if you go symmetric, negative B to B, it must come out zero. Beautiful. Above and below the axis. Uh, what about from A to B? That region would be, or how would it relate to its symmetric counterpart? The opposite of negative B to negative A. Because it will be below the axis. Uh, these ones are not so obvious from the symbols, but you'll understand in a second. Say you had a curve, a curve that was always, all y values are above or at the axis. Like that. What would you know about the area under that curve? It would have to be positive. Okay. If you had two curves, one F that was above and one G that was below or even at the most equal to, then what would you know about the area under F as compared to the area under G? The area under F must be greater than the area under G. Now that also holds true for negatives, by the way. Um, you would really say that F's values would be lesser negatives and therefore greater. With me? Um, last but not least, let there be a curve. I'm going to draw this two pictures actually because my picture got kind of busy here. Let F be a curve like this. And L is defined as the lower limit for the curve. Oh man, I need to calibrate this thing. Okay, L is some lower bound. L stands for lower bound. If you were to look at a region from A to B, how would the area under F relate to the area under L? Greater. The area under, which we will say from A to B, the integral of F from A to B, must be greater than the area under L. Now, rather than do that calculus-wise, let's do that geometric. Because L is a constant, this region, which I missed, is a rectangle. 
What's the area of that rectangle? Base. What's the base? A minus B or B minus A? B minus A, assuming B is greater, times L. Okay? Likewise, if you had a region, or a curve rather, that had an upper bound of U, then the area under F from A to B would have to be. I'm not sure what I'm getting at here. What's this? Whatever. Must be less than or equal to B minus A times U. We? Are you with me? No? Okay. Do you agree, first of all, that the integral that I'm talking about is represents the area under the F curve? Yeah? Okay. Now, because that curve always has to be less than some constant U, then if I were to place U, I could say, boom, here's an upper bound. Now, if I compare the area under F to the area under U on the same region, this green region has to be greater than the blue region because the height is greater than or equal to at all places. Well, that green region is a rectangle with a base of B minus A and a height of U, so its area must be something like B minus A over U. Now, these will be multiple choice questions. So, say, um, they might say something like f of x is less than or equal to 3 on the region. What do you know about this? Must be less than or equal to 15. Okay. Because the width of the region is 5 units and the heights are maxed by 3, so the area is maxed by 15. Do you follow? That's what it's going to look like. Okay, these. Um, first of all, I forgot to add this into your notes. You also need this to answer the question. So would you add in that extra uh, fact of the integral from 0 to 5 of f is equal to 7? <clears throat> um, gosh, I did a little informal survey of results on this two years ago, my BC students. The people that did this kind of problem by just slapping around numbers, like, oh, okay, it's 10 minus 4. If I saw only numbers in their work, the success rate was less than 30%. But anybody that did some kind of structure to their work using the actual functions, the success rate is over 75%. So I guess the moral of that story is I will no longer allow you to just slap numbers around and hope it all works out well, I want you to actually structure it. I know these feel like, oh, these are so easy. But the success rates on these are actually pretty low in some cases. Some they're easy. Some they get kind of funky. So please structure your work. So I'm going to try and model what I would like to see. Um, so you have this region from negative 5 to negative 8. This is really the start of the show, f of x is easy. So we're going to make some kind of connection to the positive side. Uh, the first thing I would do is say, forget that nonsense. I don't like to go lesser to greater. So I'm going to rewrite this as negative 8 to negative 5 and switch the limits to integration. I just, that sticks out like a sore thumb. You know, I, I, can't, I can't take it when the limits go the wrong way. It's like seeing somebody with their pants backwards. Like, you just can't get over it. Okay, so you, am I, am I right? You know? So um, now let's talk symmetry. If f is even, then how does this relate to the positive side? Same or opposite? That, and I'm talking same. It's the same. So it'll be the same as 8 to 5 or 5 to 8? 5 to 8. Okay. Now, feels like we're home free, but we're still going to go do it the right way. Uh, now we're going to use the symmetry idea. We can find 5 to 8 by taking 
1 to 8 and subtracting away 1 to 5. So something like the opposite of, now I'm ready to actually substitute in my, so I get negative. Follow? Okay, try, uh, try the next one on your own, which we touched on a little, try that one on your own, then we'll do that last one again. Are you getting 24? I did. I don't know if I, I, I'm pretty sure I did that right. Do you agree? I'm getting positive. Did I make a mistake? Okay. All right. Uh, last but not least, this is a good gotcha problem. Uh, let's see if we can get off on the right foot here. So you have the antiderivative of x f prime. What do you think? What's the approach? U dv. Yeah, it's integration by part. It's when you see a product, the u sub or integration by parts, and one's not the derivative of the other, so integration by parts. Cool. Um, what do you reckon on your u and your dv? No? Look at that prime. Do I want to take the derivative of that Oops. or the antiderivative of that? Okay. Antiderivative. So does that mean f prime needs to be u, in which case I find du, or dv, in which case I find v? dv. So you're going to let u equal x and dv equal f prime dx, in which case du becomes dx, and v is f of x. Technically, you could have a constant there, but we have a definite integral, so we're not going to sweat that. Okay, so here we go. Uv is x, f of x. The limits of integration, uh, there's a couple different schools of thought. Some people say, write them the minute you found an antiderivative. And some people say, toss them all the way far out to the right side. I don't care what you do, but I think for this problem, I'm going to approach it this way, show the limits on each part. All right. Now the voodoo. Voodoo is f of x. That's my first step of work. What do you think? Are you cool? Okay. Um, evaluating this is 5f at 5 minus negative 5 f at negative 5. Not quite sure what's going to happen there. What about the antiderivative at the end, the definite interval? We don't have any information about negative 5 to 5, but we do have information about 0 to 5. So how do we use it? Two times. Okay, that's where the even comes in. It's two times. 0 to 5 because the function is even. Okay, 5, f of, do I know f of 5? Yes. f of 5 is 4, so I have 5 times 4. That's all well and good. I'll change those signs to 5. What's f of negative 5? 2? f of 5 is, oh. Oh, I looked at the wrong thing. Thank you, 2. Uh, what about f of negative 5? 2. Why? Because it's even. Okay. Um, and then minus 2 in the integral we set for 0 to 5 is 7. Wait. So 20 minus 14. 
Okay, that's it. Um, this is, like I said, these are pretty far beyond the book, but I do want you to be back uh, for the hardest ones, which you might see. Um, the answer is to 85 extra practice. The last one. The last one. Yeah. Last one was, uh, the last one. Just okay, I'm so glad you asked because I, I feel like there's an error there. Yeah. Yeah. There's an error that explains it. But I got it from one of the most solid college textbooks there is. I, I cannot. It's on the full I, I didn't. I have no answer. And I don't know if it's a typo or if I'm missing something. Yeah. Oh, oh. Sorry, but I get a little behind when I get that. All right. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just the kind of basic approach to this. I have not so much in this class, but in the other class, I got a little bit of a epidemic in my hands of, gosh, this looks hard. I'll just wait till he does it for me and write down what he says. Well, that's great, but you still don't can't do it on your own. Um, there's a big just so you're clear, there's a big difference between understanding it when I say it and being able to do it yourself. You understand that, right? And, and just waiting for me to do it for you gives you pretty much no good. It's worthless. Um, so part of my job this semester is to increase your time frame you're willing to persevere and wrestle with something. I, in, from, I wanted to take it back, take it from you know maybe five seconds of Oh, geez, that looks hard. I don't see it. Forget it. So maybe a minute of, I don't know, maybe I'll try this. And, yeah, you need to extend that time that you work on it before you fail. Okay? Uh, that's how you're going to be successful in the AP test and in life. So um, this, the minute I see, I understand, first of all, H is a wacky combination function. This, by the way, I'll mention this. This is a famous AP problem. It is famous because it has the lowest score averages of any AP calculus problem in history. Uh, it's actually missing part D. I skipped that part D. But the average for this was less than a 1 or 9. So if you struggle with it, you had great company in 2007. Um, so H is this combination function. First of all, if F and G are continuous, if f and g are continuous, whatever they do, then what about a combination of them? Are they, is it also going to be continuous? Yeah, this, this puts out all types of stuff. Anything this puts out, and by this I mean g, whatever this puts out goes into f. Well, f doesn't have any problems. So as far as that, don't, don't sweat that. You don't have to prove it. Just know that if you get a combination of two, cool functions, then the combination function is cool too, okay? Um, in, cal in college, you might have proved that, but here they just expect you to say it. So, um, next thing I'm hoping that you made a connection on is if they say, must there be a value, and it's just h, not the derivative of h, I hope your mind went, I v t, I v t, okay? Um, now, to know I v t, I can't say if it passes through negative 5 until I know some points on each. So what's the first thing I hope you did? Find h at 1 and h at 3. Uh, what was h at 1? f of g, this goes again to just taking your time and doing it well. What's g of 1? 2. What's f? That goes in f. What's f of 2? Nine, yeah? Yes. And then nine minus six is three. So H starts at a Y value of outcome of three. H at three then would be F of G of three minus six. G of three is four. Four goes into F, which is negative one. Negative one minus six is negative seven. Now, can we say that H has to pass through negative five? Yeah, it goes from positive 3 to negative 7. So yeah, it's got to pass through negative 5 along the way. You say your IBT stuff. As far as the justification, um, if you just said H is continuous, you're cool. But my wording said something like, because F and G are continuous and differentiable, then H also is continuous. 
Um, you don't have to, you don't need differentiability for the IV2, so continuity is fine. Um, and then you said the betweenness and then I You with me? Okay. Uh, the next one is a must there be question, but this time they're making a reference to does the derivative have to be something at a point? Well, that to me screams from VT. Uh, the conditions for differentiability need to be met, or for MVT need to be met. I said something like F and G are differentiable, so H is continuous and differentiable. Uh, again, they're not real picky on these about the open or closed interval. Uh, I just said, uh, you could say it's for all real numbers. For all real numbers. And that's good so All right. So then you would say, all right, the conditions are met by MVT. There is a, please use, there, this, besides being a hard problem, they also were super picky here. I should have said this. You've got to use what they give you. So if you said there's got to be a C, between 1 and 3, you're going to lose points because they didn't ask you to say anything about C. They said to call it R. You have to use R. Here, there's got to be an R between 1 and 3 such that H, H, not F, H of R is negative 5. In this case, they're talking a C. So you'd say there's a C between one and three, such that h prime at c, now you can't just say, hey, I plan it to be negative five. You then have to show the mean value theorem part of it, which is to say the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. You need to show this calculation and pray that it comes out to be negative five so it makes sense. Uh, h of three and h of one you already have from previous work. h at three is negative 7, h at 1 is 3 over 2. Okay, we'll do that. It is indeed negative. You follow? Okay. Um, and then this guy. I'll be interested. This, if you crashed and burned here, I'm okay with it because we don't learn this till set 98 or so. But I'll be interested to see if anybody got it. Um, before I get to the three, let's talk W prime. What's W prime? Is it f of x? The derivative of the antiderivative is the thing. Yes? Makes sense, but no, that's not right. Okay? You might then say, well, g's got to be into there something. So maybe it's you take the derivative of the antiderivative, that's f, but what's in it is not just an x, but a g. G. Now that also makes a lot of sense, but that's not right either. That's what I okay, that you're starting to get, it. but the right answer is anybody have something a little bit? Times what? G prime of x. Just that's your answer, or on top of that answer? Oh, you good. There's actually a chain rule for the point. Now again, this is for a later day, but this, the thought process is if you were to, if you were to try and figure out what the heck, W prime, what is it? The first thing you probably do is you'd say, well, let capital F be the antiderivative of F. I don't even know what to call it. I don't even know. But let's say that it would be the antiderivative evaluated from 1 to g. And I don't, again, I don't know what the antiderivative capital F is, but I don't need to. By fundamental theorem, then, that would be capital F of g of x minus capital F at 1. You follow? Now, that's just a funky way of writing w. But now consider w prime. w prime, then, would be the derivative. Now, that's where the chain rule component comes in. When I take the derivative of the outside, the derivative of capital F is the derivative of the antiderivative. That's just little f with the inside the same, but then times the derivative of the inside, g prime. Now this, I don't know what capital F is, but at 1, it's got to be constant. And so the derivative of that is 0. So there's 
W complex G rule as applied to the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So W prime at three would be F of G of three, G prime of three, which is F at four, G prime is two, and F at four is negative one. So did you get negative one times two or negative two? If you did, then give yourself a, a pat on the back for a job well done. All right? Anybody? Cole? Oh, baby. Okay. Uh, two. Where's my key here? Two. Uh, can I give you a wee bit of no, I guess it wasn't for this one. Uh, the answer was E. Okay. I'll be happy to go back over stuff. For this one, the how many places I used a lot of graphing and I got four there. Are we cool? This one? There's there one above it? Oh, C. The answer was negative two. Oh, not that. What? Three. Three? What about it? Oh, how do I do it? I do. I doodle. So, mean value theorem says average rate of change and instantaneous rate of change the same. So, I'm trying to find places where I could draw the slope just like that. Well, I, I could draw one here somewhere, here somewhere, here somewhere, and here somewhere, and that was really all I could find. That's what I got. Okay. Okay. This one, I hit, I missed this one, um, and maybe that's because I executed bad test strategy. Before I get into the math of this, what would good test strategy say in terms of what are the values of C uh, that satisfy on negative one to two? That's a good first thing to do. Get rid of the ones I don't yeah. Get rid of anything that's not on zero to two. So that's got to go, and that's got to go. And after that, then you've improved your choices, and you have a uh, little less work to do. I found it was actually negative four and zero, but negative four should have been scratched, so it's just zero. Okay? I'll be happy to go back over that in a minute. For this one, I got C is the inverse cosine of two over pi whatever that is. Uh, this one I have C is 8, and this one C is 0. No. Oh, wait, C is 2, not C is 2 here, not 8, right? Yeah. Sorry, that's I can't read my writing, I erased. 4 equals, so C is 2. Sorry about that. <coughs> okay. And... Then the back side, back side. Okay, so this is what a, this is a full AP problem that had mean value theorem in it. And the mean value theorem isn't going to be every piece. It'll be one of the four pieces typically. Okay, so this has a lot more calculus-wise going on than just mean value theorem. Um, did you, did you give me acceleration at five is approximated by change in velocity over time. Acceleration is change in velocity over time. So at five, I'm looking at it here somewhere, right? I know the time or the change in velocity over that interval is v at 10 minus v at zero over 10 minus zero. Look right here, please. If you have equal to, you just lost a point on the AP. They will absolutely count off for that. Um, it is an approximation. The minute you see approximate, you should circle it or underline it or something. You should never have any hard equal in here. It's an approximation. Uh, v at 10, then that's something like 2.3 minus 2 over 10. So 0.3 over 10, which strangely you could leave, but 0.03. Uh, they did say units of measure. So the velocity units were meters per second divided by time units or seconds. So the units are either meters per second squared or meters per second per second are also fine. You can do either one. You with me? 
Do you agree? Okay. Uh, using correct units, explain the meaning of that in the context of the problem. He's running his unicycle. What happens when you integrate absolute value of loss? Distance or displacement? Distance. It's integral. Okay. Is the distance um, Ben travels now in terms of the parts of four? They expect four things. What it is with units, when it is with units. So we know it's distance, units, and meters, and now when it is. From time equal zero with units, seconds, to time equal 60 seconds. Got it? Approximate. Hey, there's that approximation again. So this is approximately equal to. A left dream on sum means I'm doing rectangles. How many rectangles? Three. Are they equal bases? No. They are not. Okay, so you cannot factor out. The base of the first region is from? 0 to 10. You could write 10 minus 0 to show the base where you're coming from, but if you just had 10, that's fine. The height, you really do need to communicate where you're coming from. It's the absolute value of V at 0 or 10. 0 because we're using left. The next region is from 40 to 10 for the base, and the height is the velocity, the absolute value of the velocity at 10. And the last region is from 60 to 40, 40 to 60, rather, absolute value of V at 40. So then you get something like 10 times 2 plus 30 times 2.3 plus 20 times 2.5, maybe 20 plus 69, is that right? Plus 50. So 139 meters. Wait. Wait. Okay. All right. Finally, the idea of the day. Must there be a time when Bob's velocity is 2 meters per second? Now, this is a bit of a gotcha because must there be a time? Oh, in 40 to 60. I was going to say, yeah, right there. That's stupid. 40 to 60. Must there be a time in 40 to 60 where Bob's velocity is 2? doesn't seem to look like it because it's going from 2.5 to 4.6. So do you say no? You should say yes, there is. Why is that? Yeah, look at there. What's the average rate of change over the interval? He went 40 meters in 20 seconds. His average velocity, his average velocity is... Two meters per second. There must be an instant where you went two meters per second. Remember the table only shows me a couple, but MVT, not IVT. So the answer is yes. Yes. Um, as far as what I want to claim continuous and differentiable, B is continuous and differentiable, or B prime is continuous and differentiable? B. B. B, his position is continuous and differentiable. Don't worry about the units or on the time frame. So by MVT, there is a time. You could call it C. I'm just going to call it T in 40 to 60, where or when B prime at that time, which is the velocity at any time is B at 60 minus B at 40 over 60 minus 40, which is indeed 2 meters per second. The answer is yes. Okay. And the last one then is a part D that's meant to separate the good from the great. Uh, related rates question. Hard to get the two points here. Let's see how you did. Um, so, I don't know if you realize this, but basically it's a Pythagorean theorem kind of calculation. There's a light here, and here's Bob on his unicycle. Right, begin. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you are interested in doing the melodrama, there will be a very short 10-minute meeting after school this Friday in Mr. Murphy's room. Please be there, ASAP. Thank you. This week in the Random Act of Kindness Week, oh. do something kind and unexpected oh. oh. from here in Belmont every day this week. Hop on and Brian on this Bob. today. Okay. Tomorrow during the seventh hour, Red Rock Community College will be here to help students apply for the temptation to square root. <laughs> So, oops, this is not easy. If you are a senior and planning to have a graduation party, please put your party date and time on the calendar in the senior lounge so we don't have a bunch of parties with the same class. Dazzling Jags, congratulations to the Devlin Mock Trial team for their stellar performances at regional. So, what you get? Something like the three halves? The award that MSU Cure received the award for best witness. Montreal team will be the Wells County Courthouse on March 10th. Go Jag Warriors and That was rough. Great job, boys, on their free of Stanley Lake on Saturday. Just one more week of week games left with home games last senior night on Tuesday as varsity takes on Little Town at 7 and away at Greenmount on Thursday. Varsity at 530. Go Jacks. Also, congrats to your girls when the team has to come out today on Thursday and Friday. And a shout out to Abby Belief for winning the 200 free and the 500 free. That's all you know, please. Have a great day. Uh, this is kind of shorthand, but this is how I approached it. I used MVT for A as applied to F prime to show F doubles negative. Uh, IVT for B. And then C, I copied this. I checked it. I copied it straight out of a Wigowski book, which is what they use at Mines. It's a really quality book. And I cannot, for the life of me, figure out how to do this problem, if it's possible. Is it? But the book, it might be a type I, I, so if you have C, then if you don't have C, then it's fine. But yeah, that, greater than zero would be cool. I don't know how to do it. That's a business. 
Yes, it's due today. That's his request. Okay, right on. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.